engagement specialist at the Georgia Department of Education. Recently, I presented with two colleagues a presentation that went through the indicators for family engagement as it's related to Title I cross-functional monitoring. We also answered some frequently asked questions. We briefly went over each indicator and elaborated on some, but the best part is we shared a lot of resources that go along with each indicator to help with the work that you do. So I hope you'll take the time to watch this recording and add some tools to your toolbox. Today we're going to talk about combining requirements and funding. So me as a family engagement specialist have teamed up with our area title one specialist and we're going to be going through the family engagement indicators today that you will see um, of course when you're monitored but what you should be doing um, as far as the law is concerned and also addressing some of those frequently asked questions and highlighting on some of the most um, popular findings if you will so let's get started All right, so our focus today is to review the family engagement monitoring indicators. That's indicator eight, which we're going to say for the end, and then 9.1 through 9.6. I also have packed in tons of resources for you, as well as Kathy and Claris, to support each of our indicators. And we're also going to address some of our frequently asked questions that are related to Title I, Part A. So let's look at 9.1. And 9.1 is the indicator that includes input. So here you can see the law that each LEA must provide evidence um, that they are seeking stakeholder input for each of the four pieces. So there are four pieces that you should be seeking input for in multiple ways. What does multiple mean? That means more than one. Um, so two is fine, three is great, as much as you want, but more than one. So you should be seeking input on your school, parent, and family engagement policy or plan, your school and parent compact, the building school staff capacity, and then of course that 1% set aside, and that's for LEAs who receives greater than $500,000. If that doesn't um, include you, if you receive less than $500,000, then it's not a requirement to seek input on that. Some resources that are available on our web pages. Um, we have anytime you see a little finger here or a click here um, logo, that means this is all uh, resources are attached directly. So we will be downloading these videos as well as the PowerPoint for you to access so you can click right on it. So some resources that we have on our web pages for input is. Um, a, the annual Title I parent survey. It's a Word document. Feel free to go in and adjust it to meet your needs. There's an annual evaluation tool and of course the checklist for input. We also have compact feedback forms and they're broken into grade level bands. We have an elementary one, the middle high school, we have one for parent and family members to provide feedback, as well as your staff members. So click on the green finger and it will take you directly to the web page that houses all of these forms. We also have a great YouTube channel. If you haven't checked it out, we are constantly uploading power tips and videos that we create at the department, but also that are created by your peers in the districts. Um, this is an example of one that is available for providing input from families from Blackshear Elementary School. Um, and of, of course, if you click on this graphic, you can watch this five minute video of a great example of a school collecting input. All right, money, money. Um, Claire, or Kathy, do you want to clarify this slide for us? Yes, I'll be glad to. We just wanted to remind everybody, and I'm hoping that if you're if you're a parent engagement person here and your Title I director isn't on the call or the presentation, to please share this with them because these articles are fabulous. I think they would be great for everybody in every district, principals. It, they are just great articles. 
But I want to, we wanted to remind everyone that if your allocation is below the 500,000 that um, Mandy mentioned, that 1% of input and how you spend that and having to do the 1% with your money doesn't apply, but everything else does. Okay, so I just wanted to remind everybody that if you're below that threshold, you'll still want to do the parent engagement program and policies and plans. Thanks, Mandy. Uh huh. All right, so let's look at the next indicator. 9.2 is technical assistance. Technical assistance is often confused with building school staff capacity. This is different. This is the LEA or the district level providing technical assistance down to the school level um, regarding the planning and implementation of the indicators that we're going on that we're going over today. So um, we're talking about our policies and plans and our compacts, um, our notices to um, parents of participating ELs. This could be a monthly email that the district sends out to their family engagement staff. This could be a quarterly meeting. Um, so this is a little different than building school staff capacity. This is the district level to the school level person who is in charge of the family engagement indicators. Let's move on to the next indicator, which is 9.3, and this is distribution. So distribution is the indicator that ensures that the LEA or district parent and family engagement plan or policy um, is distributed to families prior to November 1st, as well as the school level family engagement policy. Let me just make a side note. If you are a charter school or if you are a very small district, um, like possibly Tryon City that only has one Title I school per grade ban, you could send the combination policy that was created about a year or a year and a half ago. It's also on our policy webpage, which I will show you a link to that in just a second. But that um, document combines the pieces of the LEA district policy and the school policy into one so that you're not doing um, double the work. Um, also, that uh, school parent compact needs to be distributed prior to November 1st as well. As a reminder, these documents need to be distributed in more than one way. Um, that could be emailing them out as attachments, sending them home in book bags, um, sending them through a parent portal. Um, a lot of districts have them in their handbook. So parents are receiving those at the beginning of the year. You could post them on your social media page. You could post them on your school web page. So there's multiple ways that you can get these documents into your family's hands, but just make sure that they are distributed in more than one way prior to November 1st. In addition, there's always a signed copy um, that the parents received the compact. Also make sure that these documents are in a format and language that all parents can understand. Um, also, most of the, most districts and schools that I've worked with use that annual Title I meeting for their first and main method of distribution. As a side note, input cannot be collected at your annual Title I meeting. Um, input is separate. Title I meeting is just going over and sharing information about Title I um, and those plans. So you'll see, um, like I mentioned earlier, you have your input checklist and there's a note on there too to remind you that your annual Title I meeting is used for distribution and information only, not collecting input. Speaking of the annual Title I meeting, there is a great resource for you on our YouTube channel. There is a, a power tip all about getting ready for your annual Title I meeting, what it should look like, what you should do before, during, and after. So check that out. It's about eight and a half minutes long. Uh, it'll be a great resource to you. 
Again, if you click on these documents, they will take you directly to our distribution page where you will find a plethora of resources, including our checklist for distribution, sample annual Title I uh, parent meeting agendas, uh, a sample narrative for you to use. So if you're brand new and you're anxious, we have a script for you. So go check those resources out. All right, our next indicator is 9.4, and this is our school policy. So each district sends out a district level policy or plan, and this is that policy and plan that is uploaded with your CLIP, and that's what's going on right now. CLIPs are coming in all throughout the day, every day um, at this time of year, and this is where you include the LEA district policy. 9.4 is different. This is the school parent and family engagement policy. I like to look at these documents as almost like a funnel. That district policy is a big overview of what the district is doing as far as family engagement is um, concerned. As we go down into the funnel, it gets a little more focused and that's where your school policy comes in place and the specific things that your school and the grade levels are doing to meet those family engagement indicators. Um, again, charter schools and districts with only one school per grade band, you can choose to complete complete the combined parent and family engagement policy, um, which is again on our webpage. Also, if you see this little micro uh, I'm magnifying glass, um, that's also a direct link to the web pages as well. So some different resources that our team has put together for you is, one is our school parent and family engagement policy course. That's right, this is a self-paced online course and it's gonna assist you with becoming familiar with what the law says, the federal requirements and the state guidance regarding this policy. This course is gonna describe how the school will effectively engage parents and support a partnership among the school parents and the community to improve academic achievement. So if you click on the click box, it'll take you to the directions um, for getting into that course, which is on the SLDS. This course will take you through each piece of the checklist, show you what it should look like, where to get that information, and what it should include. So you will be ready to go as soon as you complete this course. Again, our policies course has tons of things for you. The policy checklist is there for you. There is an innovative template for you. There is a quality guide. There you'll see the bottom two squares is our combined template and our combined checklist if you are a charter school or school with one grade band. So if you click, click here, when you have your hands on this PowerPoint, it will take you to the page that includes all of these resources. These are Word documents, so you can type right on them. Please feel free to beg, borrow, and steal these. We've done the work for you, so make this your own. Change up your graphics if you like. Put in your information and um, use what we've prepared for you, um, feel free to do that. All right, so thinking back about that funnel where I said that the district level policy is the big piece that covers the district, and then we start coming down into that funnel and we're narrowing it down to our school level policy. Now we're at the very bottom of that funnel, and that's 9.5, our school parent compact. Our school parent compact is very focused. It's very focused on those specific school level goals. Some schools choose to do grade level compacts. Um, sometimes our high schools choose to do content related compacts. So however you choose to do it is up to you. Um, I will say, it has increased over the years and gotten better and better. And we've seen really high quality compacts, but still one of our most frequent findings is compacts 
because of the shared responsibilities. That shared responsibilities section should be directly related to your school goal. So if your school goal is about literacy and reading and incre increasing fluency, then some of those responsibilities that the teacher, parent, and student have should be related right back to reading fluency. If it's math, they should be related right back to math. Oftentimes we see generic or behavioral focused responsibilities like making sure my child gets plenty of sleep, bringing my folder home every day. Those are kind of the expectations. We expect you to go to sleep on time. We expect you to have a good breakfast. We expect you to take your homework home and bring it back. So this is more academic fo focus. So really think about that. Also, you'll see um, on our webpage that we will have some resources for you, and there are great examples of what those responsibilities should look like. In addition to that policy course, our team has also created a compact course for you. Again, this is available through the SLDS. This is going to take you through the whole process of gathering input, creating your plan, and even distributing, distributing it um, to your families. Included in this course is a discussion forum so that you can post your reflections on the course and read other messages um, that other people have put. So again, click on that green box and you will be able to access this course as well. Another resource that was put together, I just briefly mentioned that our most popular finding that we have found is in the shared responsibility. So our team has created a power tip for you that focuses on the school parent compact, but specifically those shared responsibilities, what they should look like, how they are aligned back to the school goal, and how the parent responsibility, the teacher re responsibility, and the student responsibility are connected across the compact. So take some time to watch this. Again, if you click on this graphic, you will be taken directly to this video on our YouTube channel. On our Compact's webpage, again, this is just some of the resources that are there for you. We have our Compact checklist. Um, the graphic that's in the middle uh, is linked to learning, and it doesn't get the showcase and the fanfare that it deserves, but this is the school parent compact process. And this beautifully colored um, document takes you step by step through building um, your compact, uh, what you should do, what it should look like, what it should include. So that is a great resource, so check that out. We also have um, a elementary, middle, and high school um, template there for you. We have the template, but then we also have the examples there for you. So you can take a clo close look at those um, responsibilities. You'll see that our elementary example that we have for you is grade level specific, if you choose to do that at your school. The middle school example is a school-wide specific compact, and then you'll see our high school example is focused on the content area. So you have lots of examples to kind of wrap your brain around. If you click on the big red circle that says click here, it will take you directly to that resource page. All right, indicator 9-6 is broken into two sections, but is monitored and scored as one. So we're going to look at 9-6. Point six a which is building school staff capacity. Remember, this is different from technical assistance that we talked about at 9.2. Technical assistance, again, is the LEA or district level providing support related to family engagement indicators to the school level people that are responsible for those indicators. School staff capacity is where your school level uh, representatives are educating teachers, support personnel, principals, and other school leaders um, on the, the contributions of parents, how to reach out, communicate, and work with parents as equal partners. 
our checklist, there's a, a link to it at the bottom, um, asks you to provide a building school staff capacity session twice each semester or quarterly. We also have a resource that was updated last year, Ideas for Building School Staff Capacity. I will say some of these videos that we have linked, especially that compacts video is great to share with your staff. So if you're having trouble getting an idea for how to build your school staff capacity, take a look at that resource. It is several pages long and it is full of different resources that you can use to help build the capacity of your staff. We have two great uh, video resources for you, one coming from the Savannah Chatham County Public School System um, with Debbie and Melissa. They are district title one program managers in the district and they have a great power tip on building the capacity of your school staff as well as uh, Meg and Polly from Forsyth County, and they're sharing six tips for building school staff capacity. So again, both of those are linked. The Savannah Chatham one is pretty lengthy at about 18 minutes, and then uh, about nine and a half from Forsyth County. So please uh, click on those and watch those in your spare time. And then one of our biggest questions is, who do we train? So I'm going to toss this over to Clarice and Kathy to kind of elaborate on that. Thank you, Mandy. Um, yes, who do you train? And it's an LEA decision on who constitutes other school leaders and other staff. Um, Mandy mentioned, uh, if you look at the bullet below, you know, some of the um, staff members that you may involve in training. So, you know, why do we do this? It's in the regulation and you, we're expecting that there are activities that involved these the staff down here that that so they are trained in how to build capacity, but who you include how often you do that that is an LEA decision. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, the second part of indicator 9.6 is 9.6 B building parent capacity. So these are those academic focused um, activities that you are doing with parents. Do we love a fall festival? We sure do. We love bobbing for apples and buying snow cones, but does it impact the academic success of our students? So that's where we're setting apart what a parent capacity building session should look like. Everything you're doing should involve the parents and the community to improve the academic success and everything goes back to those school and district goals. So here on this page, you can see some of the resources that are available for you on our Building Parent Capacity webpage. We have a checklist for building the capacity of parents. We have a Building Parent Capacity Crosswalk, a Parent Leadership Development Guide, and Parent Leadership Strategy Cards. There's tons of information. When you click on one of these resources, it opens up a door to even more resources. So please click on those in your spare time and check out those resources that are available for you to assist in building the capacity of your families. We also have some um, power tips available for you on our YouTube channel. Again, here is Meg and Polly from Forsyth County back to help build your family's capacity. Um, so check that video out. Um, also, a while back, I attended a uh, the Georgia Parent Mentor Partnership Conference back in 2019, and I put together a PowerPoint that focus on, focuses on engaging families using social media. How ironic that it was prior to the pandemic, uh, where social media was something that we some schools dabbled in and, and some schools dove right in. But it seems like now that we are becoming a more virtual world, hopefully moving back to some more normalcy, but we still want to access those social media tools. So this video um, will take you through that presentation where I talk about multiple different platforms um, related to uh, reaching families um, virtually. Um, of course, we don't endorse the platforms. This is just ideas that you can use, and some of these are things that we actually use at the department. So check that uh, video out as well. So 
lots of questions about food, lots of questions about transportation, lots of questions uh, that come up to me as well as all of our Title I ladies. So I'm going to hand this over um, and let them answer some of these frequently asked questions. Yes, thank you, Mandy. And I know this picture probably shows my age, doesn't it? There might be some of you out there that don't remember the commercial a long time ago about where's the beef, but we, we tried to come up with some catchy topics here to kind of intro what we think is really the most important thing. And when you look at those items below, show me the beef that you know, what you're planning to do really needs to be a part of the needs assessment, part of the school plan, the parent engagement plan. You know, we've had a lot of discussions over the course of the last 10 years, what does constitute a snack? And some people say they can get a pizza, a piece of pizza cheaper than they can provide cookies and muffins. And so what we want to really emphasize in these next couple slides is that this is an LEA decision. You want to look at allowable and reasonable and necessary, and you will see the Code of Federal, federal Regulations um, linked on the bottom. And that's where Title I gets a lot of their guidance as far as what is considered reasonable and necessary and the amount of money and the whole procurement process. So when you look at when you begin to plan and you've already at this point in the year probably had all your input and you've done your data dives and you know it our whole goal is to tie it to academic achievement and that we need effectiveness data with it. So when you begin to think well what can we serve or what what can we do we hope that this will enable you to feel a little more empowered as far as working through the process. It goes for snacks and food. And Mandy, we can look at the next slide. It's that we're gonna talk a little bit about the helpful hints here when you buy refreshments. Just remember that it's in the plan and you have a rationale with your planning process. I think what's really important is that what you purchased, the expenditures were reasonable, necessary, and that you didn't over purchase. You had a method to your madness on why you purchase so much. So again, you keep track of the cost and follow the procurement process. Thanks, Mandy. We can go to the next one. And again, get, you know, show me the massage chairs. Let's talk about reasonable and necessary for our parent resource room. Now, I know we would all love to have one of those chairs in our living room, but I don't think they would meet the necessary, reasonable and allowable clause. So that's the kind of where when you begin to think about buying furniture for parent resource centers, you know, we don't need a however much these chairs cost in our parent resource room. We want to tie it to the parents are coming in. It's in our needs assessment that they have to have a place to sit and learn. So again, we want you to think about LEA decision in the school plan, allowable, reasonable, necessary, and again to follow the Code of Federal Regulations with that. Our next slide also talks about transportation and childcare. Send the limo. Again, probably not gonna meet allowable, reasonable, and necessary in the Code of Federal Regulations standards, but the needs of having childcare and transportation absolutely should be in the school plan and in your parent engagement plan it obviously will be a need for many many parents so it certainly makes it allowable and reasonable and necessary so it's the cost that we want to talk about a limo really would meet that litmus test so just kind of to help you grab your heads around that it is an lea decision um, but you have to remember to implement all of those kind of the prongs of the test on the uh, Code of Federal Regulations. So this is one of my favorite chapters in the Federal Programs Handbook. I have to tell you that when I was at the district, we had to say, okay, so this, how do we know if Title I can pay for this interpreter? Is it special ed? Is it Title I? Does it have to be local? I mean, all those, okay, break it down. 
this hand, this chapter in the handbook, I want you to know if you've not read it, when you have to determine as far as what translations and what interpreters you can pay for, I just think this chapter outlines it beautifully. There's some scenarios in there, and that's where I would go whenever I was hit with, you know, what do you need to pay for now? We didn't have this chapter when I was there, but now it's where I tell all my directors to go. So I have to give a shout out to Parent and Family Engagement. They have just done a fabulous job of pulling all these things together for you. And I think that you'll find this, this PowerPoint to keep it by your, uh, your, right on your desktop because I think it's something you can use all year long. Thanks, Claris. <clears throat> okay, so our last indicator is indicator eight. <clears throat> and I saved this for, for the end for a reason. <clears throat> we are becoming more comfortable with this indicator. However, sometimes it still causes mass confusion. Indicator eight is the notice to parents of students being placed in a supplemental language program that is funded by Title I and or Title III. What this means in a nutshell is, this is your students that are in your standard ESOL curriculum program, but are still struggling academically. So what are we gonna do with these students? You know what, let's purchase this software to use with these students. So this is supplemental, anything above and beyond your standard ESOL curriculum. Now, some districts choose to purchase something supplemental for all of their ELs. Well, then all of those ELs will receive this document. Maybe they're only purchasing it for fourth grade ELs. Then we're only sending this letter to fourth grade ELs. Maybe it's just a handful of students that are coming to an after school um, program, an after school tutoring session, and you're paying um, for some, some workbooks that you're working with, then only those students will receive it. So this is anything above and beyond your standard ESOL curriculum that is purchased with Title I and or Title III funds that are directly impacting those students, okay? Now, this document or notification needs to be sent home within the 30, within 30 days from the beginning of school, or we're, you know, it's January and we have this group of struggling students, let's get them going with this program, then we need to send that document out two weeks with that, within two weeks of putting that child in that supplemental program. Um, so again, there's a lot of confusion with this. When we monitor, we often see the eligibility notification or we see the continuation of uh, eligibility. And that's not what we're looking for in this indicator. We're looking for this specific document. How can I figure out if a student needs to receive this letter? Well, uh, we have worked with the fabulous um, staff over in Title III, as well as Zach, our computer guru, and we've put together this um, chart for you to go through. If you click on um, this, you will be able to download this graphic, but this just takes you through the flow chart to decide, yes, we need to send this form home, or nope, that's not what it is, so check that out. But let me show you this form. They all look so similar, but look at the title. It says, Title I Parent Notification of Student Eligibility for Supplemental Language Support Services. So this is the document that we're looking for. We've already created it for you. So the only thing that you have to do is fill in those boxes there. You can see that second paragraph where it says, your child's English skill was most recently tested with blank, and you fill that in. Now that yellow part, that's where you're going to list or put a couple of sentences, some narrative about what it is that they're using. You purchased Rosetta Stone. You purchased workbooks. They're doing a lunch bunch session. They're doing an after school tutoring. That's where you put the information 
to let families know what service their child is receiving on top of that regular ESOL curriculum, okay? So you don't have to change anything except for make it personal for your school or if it's a district-wide thing, that yellow highlighted. Guess what else we've done for you? We have uh, linked this, it's a Word document so you can type right in it, but look at this second box. We have translated this into, is it 14 or 15 different languages? So it's ready to go for you. Um, so you can download that and the only thing that would need to be translated is that uh, yellow highlighted section. Um, so we've tried to make this really easy and as less confusing as possible. Um, again, this document needs to be sent home within the first 30 days of school or within two weeks of putting a child into these supplemental services. A lot of LEAs that I've talked to over the past couple of weeks have said, Mandy, what should I be doing right now? Well, of course, get those policies and compacts ready to go because we know what the first couple of weeks in school are. We're getting FDE counts and we have kindergartners that are crying and we have people who are coming back face to face who've been virtual. There's a lot going on and this piece of paper right here can be overlooked and not sent out within the first 30 days. So what I would encourage you to do is decide, are, did we purchase supplemental uh, curriculum with Title I and or Title III funds? If so, let's go ahead and type in that yellow highlighted section. Let's get these printed out and let's get these to the schools so that when they come back to school, they just need to fill in the date and the student name and get it sent out. I would encourage you to start getting these ready now because a lot of times those things with time constraints can cause a lot of uh, drama and panic. So go ahead and start looking at this. Again, if you click on the, the hand there in the pink box, it will take you directly to this page where you can download this document and download it in any of these languages that you see um, available here for you. I'm going to let uh, Kathy and Claire talk about some common monitoring findings that they have seen. Okay, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, if you're brand new to Title I, I know we've thrown a lot of information at you um, the last couple of days, and you've probably heard the word monitoring and are like, what is that? Well, we have a monitoring four-year cycle that every district that receives federal funds has a monitoring that we look at your documentation. Um, um, this year it might look a little bit differently and we'll definitely get, you'll hear more information about that and even get notified if you're on the cycle for um, this year. But that happens um, and when we look at your documentation, um, Mandy has done a fantastic job of telling you uh, what you need to do, what you need to be looking at as the year goes on, starting now, and what documents that we will need to see if you are monitored. So, unfortunately, um, we do sometimes have some monitoring findings, and what happens with that is um, when we see something um, that, that doesn't match up with the documentation we're looking for, it's a finding. And then what happens is you have to do a corrective action and tell us what you're going to do to fix it. So if you would re use those resources that Mandy has um, provided you with parent engagement, I think that you, you won't be on this list and you won't have any of these things. But we did feel like we needed to point out some common monitoring findings, and this is from last year. So some of these things may change as the time goes on. Um, some things that used to be unallowable may be allowable in the future. We just have to react as USCD changes their guidance and regulations. So this is some, these are some of the things we have found last year. Unallowable expenditures for materials for the parent resource centers. Um, we found um, some uh, purchase orders, for instance, for vaping and smoking, and there was not a tie into academic achievement. We know there's been some recent legislation about vaping, vaping and smoking being put into the curriculum. Um, so this may change. I don't know. We've not, we've not really um, delved into that yet. But door prizes for parents to attend the meetings. Um, the parent engagement coordinator was a school level person paid out of the school allocation. And then they serve the entire district, which is, is not allowable. And on the next bullet, the district level parent engagement coordinator 
only served a selective number of schools and not the entire district or serve non-Title I schools. So you have to be careful how these parent engagement coordinators are funded. If they're district level funding, then they need to serve all the Title I schools. If they come out of the school allocation, then they would just serve that one particular school. And all this gets into rank order. And we'll talk, you'll hear more about that. Or if you have questions about the funding of any of these positions, you really need to talk this over with your Title I area specialist before you put that in your budget. Um, down here, the, the last three really talk about the EL parent component. Um, the EL parent was missing from the stakeholder input meeting. The supplemental services parent notification for EL were not sent and the updated plan and compacts were not distributed in the language a parent could understand. So just be really careful of some of these things. Go back to this PowerPoint. I would even put it on my desktop and refer back to it so you don't find yourself in a situation where you do get a monitoring finding. So the next slide. Why do we tell you all this? Where is this coming from? It's not something we just sit up in the, you know, tower at the DOE and make up. All of this is coming from fiscal regulations and guidance. And if you want to see and hear more about it, we've listed the um, EDGARS, what we refer to as Education Department Guidance and Regulations, um, the CFR, which is the Code of Federal Regulations. So if you want to look these things up, um, when you take things to your board or when you have um, district level meetings and won't we'll just say this is why we have to do this, here's where you can go. Our guidance information, the OMB circulars down there, you can click any of these links and get directly to the information that it's concerned with parent engagement. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Um, okay, lastly, I wanted to just give you kind of a, a screenshot of what our homepage looks like. Um, this is the Family School Partnership Program webpage, and if you click there on that top big green finger with the yellow circle around it, it will take you directly to our homepage. You can see over on the left-hand side, there is a link to all of our different indicators, input, policies, compacts, building capacity, um, distribution. I'm currently working on updating some things, so the sidebar may change, but nothing's going away, only uh, making it better and easier to find for you. Um, the bottom three boxes with the click here um, icons are on every one of our pages, um, so you can directly get to these resources. Um, one is school transitions. There are some documents there that you can have printed out um, to send to families. They are available in both English and Spanish. We also have monitoring tools so that when it's your time to be monitored and you need a refresher or some resources um, in getting ready for that, you can click on that. And then um, you see our 2020-2021 handbook icon. We just uh, finished up our 2021-2022 handbook. I will say that no content has changed. The cover has changed and there is uh, the first page has been added. Um, and if you receive my emails, and I'll talk about that in one second, you'll receive a link to that brand new handbook. Um, and this graphic will look a little different, but there is still a direct link to um, our handbook. Um, with that said, if you are directly related to family engagement or maybe you're a federal programs director and just want to uh, keep tabs with new things that are coming out, please shoot me an email if you don't receive my monthly email. Send me an email saying, add me to your list, and I will do that. We send out a monthly email that includes um, resources, that includes um, things that are coming up, what's happening. Hey, get ready to get, make sure you're getting this letter sent out. It's getting close to the 30-day mark. So some reminders, some resources, some articles, some information. Um, we are actually sending one out tomorrow afternoon, and that will include um, a really important, exciting announcement for you, as well as some resources to share with families, and that link and cover to our new 
handbook. So here's my email address. If you want to be added to that list, please just shoot me an email if you're not receiving that. I hope this session was informative for you. I hope that you found something to help with the work that you do on a daily basis. I hope you found some ahas. And again, I hope you added some tools to your toolbox. Please feel free to reach out to me or your regional family engagement specialist if you have any other questions related to this presentation. Thanks so much.